Dear Commission Chairperson and members, dear colleagues, family, and friends, thank you for coming to my doctoral defense today. Today, I'd like to discuss with you my work in teaching evolution as an interdisciplinary science and the work that we've advanced in the last year is to develop concepts, theory, and network infrastructure for educational design research. So this work began in part inspired by the Evo Kids project and the Evo Kids resolution signed by more than 80 evolution experts, evolution education experts and educators uh, organized by Professor Dimar Graf. And in the Evo Kids resolution signed in 2015 in Gießen, Germany, we find the following statement. Evolutionary perceptions play a vital role, not only in biology, medicine, and agricultural science, but also in psychology, philosophy, sociology, economics, and political science. Even engineering sciences and information technology use evolutionary algorithms to advantage. In view of the fundamental importance of an understanding of evolution for the development of a modern worldview, it is strange that primary school children learn so little about this topic. Strange indeed. Stranger still, we think, is that even secondary students will learn little to nothing of the interdisciplinary nature of, of evolution science. And so this quote sets up the basic context for the key arguments and context for the key findings that I've summarized in my thesis. First, that evolution is an interdisciplinary science, but is not taught as such. Second, the pedagogical implications of taking this interdisciplinary approach are so expansive and previously unexplored in our field. And third, if we accept some of the conceptual issues of taking an interdisciplinary approach to evolution education, this may open up new opportunities for interdisciplinary learning more generally. And so my thesis is fo focused on developing concepts, theory, and network infrastructure to support educational design research on these challenges. It's a cumulative thesis composed of five published articles and 45 diverse scientific outputs that represent both the richness of the interdisciplinary learning potential of this direction, as well as the conceptual complexity, the conceptual minefields that open up when we try to look at evolution across different disciplines or subject areas. So in order to synthesize and make this complexity accessible, let me describe what I'll do today. First, I'll begin with chapter 2.1 from my thesis, the first of the cumulative articles, which is a teacher and student conception study on the question, are humans a cooperative species? As we look at that, we'll see that we need a further conceptual clarification within the field of evolution education. And this conceptual clarification then leads us to our approach of developing an educational design concept to empower teachers and students to better engage these perspectives. We'll give an example of our Evolving Schools project and then I'll conclude with emerging directions and uh, conclusions. So let's begin. Chapter 2.1 presents a teacher and student conception study in which we're looking at the question of are humans a cooperative species and what the challenges or opportunities for teaching about the evolution of human prosociality may be. And so we can, this is important because we can ask, why should it matter if we teach evolution as an interdisciplinary science? And we think part of the answer to that is that this work may show something deeper about how humans understand and conceptualize humans within society. So let's look at this as an example. We wanted to understand how students or teachers might reason about recent comparative behavioral research from the former psychology department here at this Max Planck Institute. And so we developed teaching materials around uh, a set of experiments that ask who is better at cooperating to sustainably use a renewable resource. 
we would explain the experimental design to students and teachers at different grade levels or levels of professional experience. And we asked them to choose a species and describe their answer. Now, while we can't generalize from our relatively small sample size, our findings did surprise us to a degree. We found that participants overwhelmingly choose chimpanzees over children, over human children, as the more cooperative species. And it would seem that increased experience with German biology education, at least, may actually increase that propensity. And when we ask participants, why do you choose this? What, why do you think that this may be the case? We get responses that are quite diverse, but sometimes include themes such as humans are greedy animals or chimpanzees are cooperative by nature. Responses that evolutionary anthropologists wouldn't exactly agree with. So there's much to discuss about why these conceptions may be or exactly what we should do with them as educators. But because this work is focused on capacity building for our field, I want to reflect here on what is the educational potential of this kind of study and this kind of lesson. So first, it demonstrates that we can use behavioral research in evolutionary anthropology to teach scientific perspectives on the origins of human capacities for cooperation. That's a novel insight for the field of evolution education and biology education more broadly. But further, we can possibly use this, this simple lesson to uh, extend reflection in multiple directions. For example, we can engage students further in reasoning about the origins of the behavioral variation that we find in these experiments. We see two different species responding very differently to very similar stimuli, even though they've been uh, evolved from common ancestral populations. Students can be engaged in thinking about what are the possible causes and trajectories that have happened over time. And this is one rich area of work that we've been developing over the years. Additionally, both of these experiments are based on a, on a classic behavioral model called the tragedy of the commons, the social dilemmas that emerge when uh, groups of individuals or agents need to use a shared renewable resource. And critically, this tragedy of the commons model has become a point of knowledge synthesis, both in evolutionary biology, but also in the interdisciplinary human sciences, as represented by our collaborators in the pro-social project. And so when we look at the educational potential of the different ways that we can engage and extend a lesson like this, we can say that some of this potential is about engaging students in reflecting on our understanding of human evolution and behavior. But if we think about this concept of tragedy of the commons and how can we avoid the social dilemmas or overcome the social dilemmas of uh, using limited resources in sustainable ways, we might think about more applied directions about how we might be able to engage some of these uh, perspectives through engaging students in school improvement and sustainable development activities as well. And so as we've explored this potential, it's become very clear that these are great opportunities, but both of these directions require significant conceptual clarification within evolution education. So let me turn to the second part of our journey here and look at this core conceptual clarification for evolution education in regards to the issues at hand. So in chapter 2.3, we introduce this metaphor of the fitness landscape, long used in evolutionary biology to understand how a population of different agents or phenotypes may fare in relation to an optimal fitness possibility. And in the human domain with, uh, with more explicit goals, we can ask how, for example, how different variations or approaches to evolution education may result in different goals or 
valued outcomes. And so here we're suggesting that we can make this distinction between a gene-centered evolution education and an interdisciplinary approach, and that this is fundamentally an issue of different goals. So in a gene-centered approach, educators would be focused on genetic evolution by natural selection and getting students to understand biology-specific and narrow definitions of core evolution concepts. Whereas in a more interdisciplinary approach, educators would be focused on student understanding of evolution of traits within complex adaptive systems, developing interdisciplinary understandings based on the generalizability of core evolution concepts. Now, these are really high level distinctions. So let's zoom in and see some more specifics of what this may entail. Let's think about how phenotypes emerge or develop over time. So here we see a, a highly simplified or idealized model in which genes for a phenotype are perhaps influenced by the environment. And now some biology educators may accept this as a simple heuristic communication tool for the basics of what's happening. But of course, some of us may like to see that students are more deeply engaged in a more complex model, perhaps one that it has more reciprocal causation or feedback loops between the different causal domains. And perhaps that might include social and cultural variation or intra-individual variation as appropriate in a given case. Now, we would regard this as one step away from the most narrow of gene-centric models. And in fact, many biology educators and education experts will readily accept the the model on the right, the B model, uh, what we might call a developmental systems model, as a uh, as an acceptable scientific goal, uh, and we may quibble over the relative complexity or when students may be best exposed to the different uh, amounts of complexity in this model. Uh, but many of us agree that this is an appropriate goal for biology education. Uh, however, even within this model, there's actually still another level of conceptual clarification that we must engage. So here we'll find wide disagreement about what counts conceptually within the development of evolutionary explanations. So for example, where in this model do we apply the concept of variation? Where do we apply the concept of inheritance or selection? So for the strong or narrow gene centrist, the answer to all of these questions is at the level of the gene. But if we take a more interdisciplinary approach, we may apply these concepts across the different causal domains and across different levels of organization. And so what's at stake here is this fundamental question, how generalizable are evolutionary concepts when we construct evolutionary explanations? And how different scientists or different educators answer that question has cascading effects in terms of our assumptions and beliefs about how to best structure the evolution education curriculum and perhaps the interdisciplinary curriculum more broadly. And we could continue down the road of the, the causal complexities and we've developed tools and uh, more detailed explanations within our chapter 2.4 but I won't go further here, uh, except that we can discuss this during questions uh, because there are actually so many implications uh, that they can't possibly be discussed uh, in full here. So only to say that we will be uh, continuing to explore what would it mean if we do take this interdisciplinary approach seriously, if we begin to explore this interdisciplinary evolution education landscape. And here we want to suggest that exploration of this new landscape requires supports. It requires an educational design concept. And so that brings us to the midway point in the presentation the third section on our educational design concept. Here, we're trying to develop high level educational design guidance for an interdisciplinary evolution education. And the, the hallmark of this work has been our teacher's guide. Uh, 
which is based on educational design research trends, advances in teaching for conceptual understanding and learning transfer, an extensive cross-disciplinary literature review of theories, methods, and discourse spanning evolution education, evolutionary biology, and evolutionary anthropology. And it's been revised through classroom co-design work over the years. Now, to sum up the design concept in the most simple terms, we describe it as helping students to reflect on the everyday experience of human behavior in the light of evolution and sustainability. That's the elevator pitch of a much more complex vision. And to help operationalize this for educators and researchers, we've developed a range of tools from design principles and content anchors that can help structure lessons, units, or curriculum, to theories of improvement and educational design research frameworks that can help guide researchers and school improvement specialists in using these perspectives. Now, critically, all of this has been developed with what uh, Susan McKenney and George Reeves describe as high compatibility and tolerance. That's the idea that we want guidance and uh, innovation supports to be general enough that they are applicable across school contexts, cultures, and subject areas, yet novel and adaptable enough to support local design thinking. And I won't go further into the details of this educational design concept, other than to highlight our theory of improvement that you've already been exposed to. And this is just the idea that innovations can be supported by focusing on two broad classes of educational intervention, helping students to reflect on our understanding of human evolution and behavior and engaging students in school improvements and sustainable development. And to help further operationalize that, uh, our work in the Comparative Cultural Psychology Department here at this Max Planck Institute has advanced what we call a twin lab model or an educational design lab and a community science lab to help advance and structure innovations in educational design research here. So let me move on to share just one of the more robust uh, examples at the intersection of all of this work. And this is our Evolving Schools Community Science Project. So evolutionary anthropologists are curious about the evolution of teaching and learning and even formal schooling. One such scientist, Peter Gray, has posited that our long evolutionary history as hunter-gatherers in supposedly egalitarian communities suggests that modern schooling is a mismatched cultural institution for youth, and therefore that schools should be radically different and give students much more freedom to learn, as Peter Gray says. And so we were interested, not in the truth of that argument in some sense, but we wanted to know how do school stakeholders relate to and reason about this kind of evolutionary educational psychology? How do stakeholder theories of schooling relate to various scientific theories of schooling such as this? And so importantly, we developed this not as a traditional top-down study developed by researchers, but as part of our regular community science lab meetings and student project groups in which we work to develop students as community scientists, developing surveys, focus groups, interviews, classroom discussions, and lesson co-design activities. And now we could go deeper into some of the exploratory data from these early methods, uh, but again, the focus of this thesis is on concepts, theories, and infrastructure for this kind of work. So I wanna highlight here just one of the uh, key insights, the emerging conceptual landscape that we describe as theories of schooling. And so this is just the idea that any human exposed to school systems during their life will likely develop intuitive beliefs about the nature, purpose, and perhaps potential optimum design of, of how schools could or ought to be. Some of us 
go on to become scientists or use science in different ways or different disciplinary approaches. But there is a landscape of ethno-diverse theories of schooling. And these theories are structured around uh, certain possible subdomains in terms of how we may actually improve schools or the, the nature and future of schools. And they may be informed by broader, more general, more distal understandings about theories of human origins, diversity, and flexibility. And so just to make that landscape a little bit more clear, let's look at one other element of this evolving schools project in which we sought to clarify the potential of understanding theories of school origins. And so again, evolutionary anthropologists are very interested in the origins of social learning, teaching, and the cultural evolution of schools. And here we've constructed a very simple, perhaps student accessible uh, timeline uh, of approximate key, key dates that we may think of. But before we shared this with students, we wanted to ask them, when and why did humans first create schools? How long has teaching existed in our species? And are other species teaching their offspring? Now, again, we could spend a lot of time on thinking through some of what the, the early findings of this work are, only to say here that we find that students have some conceptions that may be viewed as scientifically adequate, such as the relationship of the origins of schooling to societal complexity, and other, other views that are, may be common that may be viewed as scientific misconceptions, such as the idea that teaching is common across the animal kingdom. And so all of this work is, again, exploratory and introductory to map out the conceptual space of theories of schooling and begin to offer uh, proof of concept across and perhaps between these constructs within our theory of improvement. But none of these are actually yet hitting the aim of, of influencing school improvement. And what we've begun to develop together with other colleagues in the cultural evolution sciences is to conceptualize how we can begin to take stakeholder theories of schooling and scientific theories of schooling and develop community-based processes to actually drive valued school improvement, a process we call community-based cultural evolution. And there is, of course, so much more. There's uh, our collection of agent-based models of the tragedy of the commons and social evolution. There's youth-oriented and youth-reviewed scientific communications and more, but uh, all based on this coherent educational design concept. N of course, there's not enough time to discuss this, so I'll conclude with emerging directions. And here, I want to highlight our project, Open Evo. Open Evo is what we consider to be base camp on this mountain of interdisciplinary evolution education. We're working towards open networked and interdisciplinary educational design research through the development of IT infrastructure and cross community networking. And so the kind of crown jewel of this project has been our dedicated Moodle server here at this Max Planck Institute in which we're developing a specialized learning ecosystem, an online learning hub and educational research hub for interdisciplinary evolution education approaches. We're currently finishing our first semester running our uh, teacher education module on human behavior and sustainable development that has otherwise been running for five previous semesters at the University of Leipzig and elsewhere. This is based on our educational design concept and engages pre-service teachers across subject areas, and it serves as an engine for educational innovation and student thesis work. We're currently running that module as well as an in-service biology teacher uh, training module and several community-based field site modules, such as with our students here in Leipzig, as well as in New York. And Looking forward, looking into the future, we're beginning to 
conceptualize and build capacity for Middle Ger Germany or Mitte Deutschland as a community-based field site region for this kind of teacher development and youth-led school improvement based on our educational design concept. And here, we're in beginning to engage different groups to work with our Open Evo Learning Hub to advance all the materials I've just described. And this is being done through a more formal cooperation between our Max Planck Institute here and the Biologie Didactic Group at University of Jena, as well as with a sizable three-year capacity building grant that we've acquired with pro-social schools. So in conclusion, while the interdisciplinary evolution education landscape is vast and previously unexplored, I have clarified some of the core conceptual issues and pedagogical implications regarding what it would mean to teach evolution as an interdisciplinary science. And I've previewed a small glimpse of this expansive and emerging landscape of the educational opportunity before us. Specifically, I've argued that we've created a base camp on this emerging landscape. Our educational design concept, our interdis interdisciplinary teacher education programming, the Evolving Schools Community Science Project, and the Open Evo Learning Hub all give new tools and directions for educators and researchers to begin exploring, navigating, and building new valued innovations on this landscape. And so in conclusion, I submit that this thesis has advanced concepts, theories, and network infrastructure for educational design research. And so with that, I thank you for your attention. And of course, this work has itself been a highly cooperative effort. My amazing wife and colleague, Dr. Susan Hanisch, has been uh, a collaborator and co-designer of absolutely everything that we've seen here. And without this, that would be absolutely impossible. Uh, Professor Daniel Howne and the entire team at the Max Planck Institute uh, in our department at the Institute and the support of the Max Planck Society as a whole has been absolutely vital in this work. Professor Uwe Hosfeld and his team at the University of Vienna Biologie Didactic has revived my faith and optimism in the educational potential of university-based teacher education groups. And I'm looking forward to our continued building of capacity for this kind of work. Our community science lab youth researchers are four students that have been with us since 2019 for, for two and a half years now of consistent weekly meetings to develop some of the innovations we've just seen. So many international and German-based uh, collaborators have been absolutely essential here. And then, of course, my parents, John and Rosanna, have given me support uh, that would otherwise make all of this impossible. And so thank you, and I look forward to your questions.